All right. You guys ready for a message this morning? I'm ready to preach this morning. I'm telling you, I've been, I've been, I've been telling the team all morning, like, this is a message that it, it's just, you know, sometimes pastors show up and they, we want you to believe that, like, we're, all of these messages are just equally important to us and equally, uh, you know, now some of them mean a little bit more than others. Uh, and, and this is one that I have been ex- excited to preach uh, for a little while now. So I'm glad that you guys are here joining us uh, this morning. Uh, whether you're in the house or whether you're online, uh, this is something where we are trusting and believing that God is going to show up and do something amazing uh, with this next time that we've got. We are in the middle of a series called Come Home for Christmas, and in the middle of what we're doing is kind of something different. We're taking two different texts, two different parts of different Gospels, and we are marrying together Luke chapter 15, the story of the prodigal son, uh, with uh, John chapter 1, which really describes... Um, it describes uh, kind of what happened at Christmas and how the word became flesh and blood and it moved into the neighborhood. And uh, so we're going to move a little bit farther this week in the story of the prodigal son. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn those open to Luke chapter 15. We're going to start there and then we're going to see if John chapter 1 can help that passage just a little bit. Uh, So we're going to be in Luke 15 and I'm going to read verses 11 through 14. It says, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. We talked last week a little bit about that, like that's the death wish for the father. That is a son coming to uh, his father and saying, you're better off, I'm, I'm better off if you're dead than alive. Uh, and that is a rough, rough deal. A few days later, this younger son, he packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, everybody say, I came to my senses. (laughs) One more time, I came to my senses. He said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have enough food to spare. And here I'm dying of hunger. I'll go home to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. I want to skip forward to John chapter 1, and this is starting in verse 14. It says, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. That is the story of Christmas. Skipping down to verse 16, it says, we all live off his generous abundance, gift after gift after gift, We got the basics from Moses, and then this exuberant giving and receiving. This endless knowing and understanding. All this came through Jesus, the Messiah. No one has ever seen God, not so much as a glimpse, but this one-of-a-kind God expression who exists at the very heart of the Father has made him plain as day. My message title for this morning is Home is a Who. Home is a who. It ain't a place, it's a who. Let's talk about that, but let's pray before we do. Jesus, would you come into, this, uh, come into this moment as we open up your word, and would you speak to us about not just the kind of life that you want us to live or the kinds of, uh, the kinds of ways that you want us to be following you, but would you speak to us about the vision you have for our lives in the parts of us that have lost any kind of hope for a way forward. God, we pray especially for those today who may be struggling, who may feel stuck, who may be um, feeling like the wheels have come off the wagon of life and they can't see a way forward. Would you be with those of us who are brokenhearted in a way that is powerful and that is real and that is tangible and that it calls us to something better and different and that we know it's possible could be our greatest joy in life. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Amen. You know, a lot of you know that I teach seventh grade uh, when I'm not here. I teach seventh grade ELA um, at, uh, at a local middle school uh, here in the Twin Cities. And, um, you know, I, I'm going to level with you guys. Uh, this year has sucked. Uh, it's not been fun. Uh, it, it, this, is, this has been a really, really hard year. These, these kids have not been around other human beings in a really long time, okay? And, and it shows. They also haven't been held accountable for anything in a really long time. And that shows uh, as well. But one of the bright spots for me this year uh, has been a student of mine who came a couple of months, uh, couple of months into the school year. His name is Leroy. And Leroy, my man Leroy, is quickly rising in the ranks of my favorite students that I've ever had the opportunity to teach. By the way, I hope I'm not bursting anybody's bubble here. You do know that teachers have favorites, right? Like if, <laughs> I know that we tell you, you know, when you're in school that, that we don't have favorites and we love all our children the same. That's not true at all. It's not even close to true. Uh, we have lists of students that, that we're really close to and that we love and that we have other lists of students that, I mean, we just, we'll say we love them less, okay? We'll just say it that way uh, and leave it at that. But Leroy is awesome, man. Leroy's got this real nasal voice, talks up here, kind of like this, and he's also from Louisiana, so he's got a real thick southern accent, and he's just all up here all the time. I have a thing with my seventh graders called Mr. H's Top Five, where at the beginning of class, every single class, they can put their name on a board. Five kids get to ask me any questions about anything. Could have to do with class, could have to do with life outside of class, could have to do with anything. They get to ask me all kinds of questions, and, and it's totally up to them where it goes. Leroy is just, he's always putting his name down, and he's always very, very interested in my favorite kinds of foods. I don't know why. He's just super interested in my food. Mr. Heinrich, Mr. Heinrich, come on, man, come on, man. What's your favorite meal? Like, you, you're going to die and you're on death row, right? And you're like, what's one, one meal you're going to have? You, what's one meal? You're going to have that Italian food, Mr. Heinrich? You're going to have that good old pasta? You know, you look like a man who likes this pasta, you know. I bet you like your pasta, Mr. Heinrich. I know, I know. I bet you a steak man, Mr. Heinrich. I bet you like a good, yeah, buddy. I bet you like one of them good old, big old steaks. And, you know, I bet, I bet, I bet, Mr. Heinrichs, I bet you like to have your, yourself some steak and wine. You like to have some wine with steak, Mr. Heinrichs? You like to have some wine with your, with your steak? And the funny part of it is, the kid pretty much has me pegged. It, uh, that's it. That's, those are my favorite foods. Uh, I, I love that. <laughs> I love that. He said that to me one class. He went off on the whole thing with steak and wine, this whole thing. And, and it's become like a running joke between us. And so now on Fridays, as the week is ending, Leroy will come to me and, uh, and he'll tell me, Mr. Heinrich, hope you have a good weekend. Hope you can go home and relax and have yourself some of that good steak and wine, Mr. Heinrich. Go have some of that steak and wine. You know you're going to do it. So go do it. He's always talking to me like this. It's just kind of a funny thing. Leroy comes from Louisiana, but the truth is that much of his family, his extended family, comes from the Chicago area. And, um, and in the middle of the Chicago area, his family is heavily involved with and troubled by um, gangs and gang violence and all of that kind of stuff. Twice this year already, Leroy has missed extended time in school uh, because of it. He, he came up to me one time and he said, uh, Mr. Mr. Heinrichs, I'm not going to be here next week. Yeah, I'm going uh, to be out of school the next few days because my cousin, he got, he got shot down in Chicago. And my mama says we got to go to his funeral, so I'm not going to be here. Another time, Leroy missed school because uh, some, friends, some friends of my mama, yeah, yeah they, got, they got some trouble with the law down in Chicago. And so we're going to go down there and we're going we're gonna to help, help them out a little bit. I'm not going to be here next week, Mr. Heinrichs, but, but you make sure you have some of that steak and wine now. Remember that steak and wine. You've got, you got to have that. Make sure you get that. Last week, before students went home for the weekend, Leroy came up to me and he was looking just kind of grimmer than he normally does. He had his hoodie pulled up, his thing pulled up, like all he can see is this. You can just see its little circle uh, of his face. And he just looked real serious and real hardened. And he told me, uh, Mr. Heinrichs, uh, December 14 is going to be my last day up here in this school. I said, uh, what's going on, Leroy? Well, why, why are, what, you just got here. You've only been here barely a couple of months. And he said, yeah, 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 my, my mama and me, yeah, we, we move him before Christmas. We're going to move. I said, well, where are you moving to? 
Yeah, we got, we, we got, we got to move to Chicago, Mr. Heinrichs. We got to move to Chicago because I, I guess our family needs us down there. We're in some trouble, and we got to go help them, help them out a little bit. Just remember, you know, when I'm gone, you still got to have that steak and wine. You have that steak and wine, Mr. Heinrich, you know. Don't forget about that now. I said, I won't, I won't forget. I'll be right. I'm not going to forget. The kid is 12. It's not even Christmas. And he's already headed to his third school this year. And he's doing it in the middle of circumstances that are a lot less than ideal. Now, I didn't say it, but, I mean, look, like, just us, right? What hope does Leroy have in the middle of the context of what's going on in his situation down there? What hope does he have that life is going to be like a healthy, good, positive, forward-moving kind of thing? That he's going to be growing up like a, the way that a kid should be growing up? It's probably a lot more likely that it's going to be a hard life. It's going to be a dangerous life. Maybe even a life that he doesn't want. But for whatever reason, because of his family situation, because of the context that he's in, and because of the futures that people have kind of tied themselves to in the middle of his life, he's sort of locked into that in, in, in his life situation. Now listen, as a teacher, these are the stories that break your heart. They really are. I want so badly to just like reach into Leroy's soul and speak life over him and tell him like life doesn't have to be like this for you and we can do something better than this. And Leroy, I need you to see beyond your circumstances to a life that's possible for you if you just kind of do something a little bit different that you can have a different kind of future than your family or that your cousins have. And I know that I can say all that and I can speak all that over, it, over him. And believe me, I will before he leaves my classroom. I know I can do that. But do you think that my words are going to really speak louder than his circumstances in Leroy's life and in his mind and in his heart? I mean, isn't it true that the circumstances of our lives often scream at us about what's really possible moving forward? They do. They've done it in my life. Now, you might say, you know, well, Leroy has this problem because he's 12. You know, Seth, that's the issue. He's 12. How much choice does a 12-year-old really have about the circumstances of their life, right? Well, I don't know. How much choice do you have about yours? Because I know full-grown adults with the same problem, don't you? I do. People who, because of the nature of their life situation, because of their addiction, because of decisions they've made, because of the past, because of their family, because of the financial situation they find themselves in, because of the condition of their marriage, because of the diagnosis they've received, the medical situation they're walking through, whatever it is, they feel like the future that's ahead of them might not be the future that they wanted, but it's the only future I've got. It's all that I've got in front of me. And I feel locked into it. Nothing can ever, ever change about that. I'm just curious. If we were to look around in your spirit this morning, right? If we were to, like, get into, like, detective mode with it, and I took a flashlight, and I kind of started kind of looking into dark, part, dark parts of your heart and of your mind and of your thought life and where your spirit's been this past week, I'm just curious, what hurts and habits would we find that are driven by the deep-rooted belief that life just can't be any different than it is right now. It just can't be. How come? Because it can't be. That's not a reason, that's a reality. And that reality tends to inform how we live. You know, we're talking about this whole series about come home for Christmas. And listen, I know that there's a lot of us who are kind of thinking, you know, Pastor Seth, that's a really nice idea. Come home for Christmas. How, how very Hallmark Channel of you, right? Like, that, 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 that's just awesome. But what do we do when we left home a long time ago and there's no going back, there's no getting out of it, it's gone too far, and my circumstances in the present are locking me into a mindset about the future, and it's a future that I never wanted to begin with. I never set out for my life to look like this. I never got married thinking this is where it was going to end. I never got, got into um, the financial mess that I was in when I was buying things, thinking like, oh, this is going to end me this way. That's never how we do it. So listen, can, I, I want to preach to some Leroy's this morning. Can I do that? Is that all right? 
I want to preach to some leaders, talk to some people who may be sitting in a hospital bed feeling locked into a life ahead of them that they never wanted. I want to talk to some people who are caught in addictions or stuff that they can't seem to shake and it's wrecking their lives and they can't see a way out. Just anybody who's ever thought about your life like this is all there's ever going to be and there's no way out of it. Have you ever been there in your life? I have. I have. I distinctly remember sitting behind the wheel of a parked Suburban, staring into space, no job, newly divorced, no money, no real friends, staring down the barrel of a life that I was living that I kept asking myself, how did I get here? I don't understand. I didn't want this kind of life. This, this, this can't be, this got to be like a bad dream or, or some, kind of a, some kind of a disconnect going on. Like I had a hard time even believing that it was real. It was incomprehensible to me. It's this feeling like I can't, I can't go home again. I can't go home again. I, I, can't, I can't get back what I've lost. And what I want to tell you this morning is that if that's ever been you, I just want to encourage you that, listen, if I can find my way home, you can too, okay? And Luke 15 and John 1 are about to punch your ticket home, okay? But there are a couple things we've got to get clear about what home is if we're going to head back there and find some hope together. See that? All right, so let's take a look at this. The piece is this. First thing, home is not. Home is not a place to return to. It's not a place to return to. Even if you could go back, you're not the same. Everybody say it with me. Home is not a place. Let's do it again. Home is not a place. If there was ever anybody who ever felt like the future is locked up and it's a done deal, it's my man from Luke 15. Luke 15. This dude has burned every bridge imaginable to every positive person that's ever been a part of his life. He has partied away all the money that he's demanded from his father. He told his family. He basically wishes that they were dead. He's alienated himself from his brother. He's just openly rejected everything that his life has been all about up until this point. And now he's in this position where he's lost everything. He's lost it all. And so what's happening is this trust fund baby and professional party animal is now a pig farmer, okay? By the way, trust fund babies don't always make great pig farmers, okay? They just don't, okay? And so he's hungry, and he's poor, and he's got so many problems that have been beating him down and beating him down, and that he's at the point where he's, <laughs> he's looking at the pigs and what he's throwing to the pigs, the slop that he's throwing to the pigs, and even that is starting to look good to him. That's how hungry my man is. You think this is the future he imagined when he left his father's house? I don't. I don't. I think he probably would have stayed home if he knew how this was going to work out. I think he probably saw this going a lot differently uh, in his mind. Like maybe this money is going to lead to freedom and that freedom is going to help me to become the best version of myself. And I'm going to like do all the things that I always want to do and live the life I want to live. When you're young, don't you always sort of feel like that? When, you, when you, you haven't left home yet and you're still, you're still, whether you're living at home or you're in your hometown, you just haven't experienced much yet. Man, when you're young, there's a part of us that we're thinking like we're living in the movie Footloose, don't we? Right? This town is like holding me back, right? It's the town. This town it's these people, these people hold me back, man. Like all my potential, I just, I can't reach my potential right here. I can't do this. Right? Like, we start singing Footloose in our head. We need to break free. We need to do our own thing. We need all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I'd be a legend if it weren't for this stupid place and these stupid people just holding me all back all the time. And of course you feel that way. Of course you do. Because nothing has happened to you yet. Right? You haven't lived yet. You haven't gotten out there and done anything. So of course you're the star of your own movie that's playing in your brain. Of course you are. But then a funny thing happens when you get out in the, in the world, doesn't it? The movie doesn't go the way you thought it was going to go. So we keep looking 
for experiences and plot twists and characters to add to the movie that will kind of bend the script back to where we thought it should be going in the first place, but it, it never really gets there. Now, listen, to this kid's credit, he's got a plan to go home. He's got a plan. The problem with the plan, though, is that it's a plan that was made in pig slop. <laughs> okay? Whether the pig slop in his mind or the pig slop he's actually sitting in. Like, it, it's not really a plan to get back to where he once was. In fact, he might not even think that it's a plan that's going to work at all. I mean, the reality is if he goes home and he shows up back at his father's place, it's going to be more like a Jerry Springer episode than it is any kind of a welcome home. That, that's kind of in his mind what's going to be going on. His greatest prayer, like in his mind, the big miracle would be that he could go home not as a son, but as a servant. That's the hope. That's the hope. Why? Because he's lived some life now. And when you've done that, like you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Right? You, you can't, th these ships have sailed, like stuff has happened. I can't undo what I've already done. So when I go home, I know it's never going to be like it once was because I can never unexperience what I've experienced or unsay what I've already said. I can't unmarry who I've married. I can't unspend what I've already spent. I can't uninjure myself from things that have hurt me. So listen, this kid, he can go back to his father's house. But that doesn't mean he's going home. Do you see the difference? Do you see the difference? You guys are going to make me work for it today. I'll go after it. That's all right. Okay. So if we're going to go home, the first thing we need to stop trying to do is to pretend that we haven't been affected by what we've been affected by. Stop pretending. Just, just, just stop it. Oh, it wasn't that big deal. It wasn't, I'm, I'm fine. It's all going to be great. I'm You're sitting in slop. It's not fine. It's not okay. It has affected you. It has changed you. It has messed with you. Probably in ways that you're not even totally aware of. Slop? What slop? I see no slop. No pigs here. I don't know what you're talking about. Right? We all see it. This kid knows that. Listen, if I'm going to go home at all, I know that things have changed, so I can't go home as a son. i got to go home as a servant. We've got to acknowledge the, sl the slop, my friends. Acknowledge it. Because the slop is the reality. Henry Cloud says that reality is always your friend. No matter what the reality is, whether it's a good reality, bad reality, a financial reality, a relational reality, an economic reality, a physical health reality, reality is always your friend. Why? Because until we get real about what reality is, we can't deal with it. We can't understand it. We can't, can't leverage this to move somewhere else. So reality is always your friend. Pretending our slop isn't pig's food isn't going to get anybody home. Are you with me? So acknowledge the slop. You know, the trouble for a lot of us is that we know that we aren't the same person that we were when we left. And so for a lot of us, we think that we can't go home at all. So instead of even coming up with a pretend plan, we just sit in the slop. Or worse, we start eating it. Start eating it. And the reason we do is because we get hung up on this next point. And that's this. Watch this now. Home is not your circumstances or your feelings. Whether you're up or whether you're down, your circumstances and the feelings that come with them are temporary. They're temporary. My man from Luke 15 knows that, okay, if I'm going to go home again, I'm not the same. Some stuff has happened to me. I've been through some things. So I'm not the same. So he's thinking he's got to go home for, as a servant because he's nuked every other option in his life, right? We talked about that. So I can never be anything different than I am now. So what does he do? This is what he did. Th this is his big plan. And this is directly from the scriptures. He says, I'll go home to my father and I'm going to say, father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Five words. They carry a nuclear payload of weight. I am no longer worthy of anything. Of anything. He hasn't even tried a conversation with his father yet. Hasn't lifted a finger to try to pick himself up and get out of the slop. Hasn't even tried yet. And he's already given up on what he's worthy of. 
His circumstances have led him to some feelings about himself, and his feelings about himself have caused some beliefs about what's possible for him, and those beliefs are leading to some actions. So here's what he doesn't understand. He, he's almost there, but he, he hasn't quite learned this yet. It's coming, okay? It's coming, but he's not there yet. Just a few sentences ago in Jesus' story, this dude was on top of the world. Okay, remember that? He's like at the club. It's all going down. It's, he's having a good time at the club. It made, he had made it in the shade with a glass of lemonade. It's all fine, and it's all fun. And he's the life of the party, and he's living it up, and he thought that the thing was never going to end. And now, where is he? He's sitting in slop with pigs, and it's nasty, and it's gross, and it's disgusting, and it smells really bad. And even the pig farmer, even a pig farmer, had to be persuaded to let this kid Feed the pigs the slop. He looked the kid up and down, and he's like, I, uh, I guess so. I don't know. I guess you can feed my pigs. What he doesn't understand is that when, when he left home, when, 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 like he left home with this problem, and he still hasn't quite figured it out, is that if you live long enough, okay, you're going to go through and experience seasons of life. Life moves in seasons. It moves in chapters. Now listen, sometimes the season that you're walking through is going to go really, really well. And life is going to be good. Other times the season that you're walking through is going to be really, really hard. Sometimes probably more painful than you ever imagined life could be. And you're going to feel stuck in the slop. Neither of those situations are permanent. Neither the highs nor the lows are permanent. That's the way life works, guys. It happens to everybody. If you live long enough, you're going to experience both really, really great highs that you never expected you'd experience. And you're going to experience really deep troubles that you never saw coming. And that just kind of took you out at the knees. Your worth is not found in those circumstances or in the feelings that come with it. They're not the same. So here's what most people do. Here's what most people do. They think that what they need isn't like a heart transformation or, or like, a, like a renovation of their emotional life or something like that. What most people think they need is to get back to feeling a certain kind of way, right? So when I'm in the slop, what I need to do is I need to have the security that I used to feel. I need to chase the feeling that I had when they liked me. I don't need a real, you know, maturation or redemption or heart transformation. What I need is a circumstances engineer to come in and reshape this situation. I need to manage my circumstances. By the way, this is the reason that Instagram and the filters in it have made it into the empire that it is today. Okay? It's circumstance management getting other people to believe the circumstances are something that they're really not. Because, why? Because when I have money again, oh, that's the problem, then I'm going to be okay, right? If I can, I, I can feel like a, like a man or a woman loves me again, if I can feel that, then I'm going to be all right. That's going to be the thing that's going to, I've got to manage that circumstance. If I can feel desirable to somebody, then that's going to fix the hole that I've got deep inside of me. If I can look like I'm doing healthy stuff and kind of cover up all the unhealthy stuff that I'm doing and keep that right back here, not post that kind of stuff, then, then, then that's going to make me okay. If I can get my circumstances back to looking like they did before all of this happened, then I'll feel worthy again. People who feel unworthy of anything will sit in all kinds of pig slop, you guys. Have you ever noticed this? Feeling unworthy makes pig slop look like good food instead of what it really is. And that's a jacked up perspective that comes from emotional and spiritual starvation. That's what it is. The, the problem is that this kid is at the party and he's living it up and, the, and life is good, or whether he's sitting in the slop, that feeling of being unworthy hasn't really gone away in him, has it? It's still there. It's still running around inside him. Either he's got money and he's trying to prove how worthy he is to the world by like this extravagant and insane, insane living that he's got going on. Or he doesn't have the money and, and he's got circumstances reinforcing every crappy thing he's ever felt about himself. Okay? I hate my life. I'm going to eat this slop. 
either one of these, either one of these circumstances still have like a kid with a messed up heart in the middle of it. Either one of them, whether life is good or whether life is bad. The feelings and the circumstances change. They always change. And they haven't fixed anything. None of them have. He's still chasing circumstances and he's engineering feelings because he knows, okay, I can't go back to how it once was. Okay, we talked about that. We know that. But he also knows, I can't stay here because I'm starving. I am unworthy. It's a feeling that will make you a master manipulator of circumstances and a professional chaser of feelings. But circumstances and feelings, they change all the time. So what do we do then? Okay, what do we do? We can't be home in either one of them, can we? Because it never stays the same. And, and if circumstances and feelings are always changing, then I'm just going to have to constantly reinvent myself. I'm going to have to constantly reapply myself. I'm going to have to constantly be like chasing something over and over and over again every time my circumstances change. And that's an exhausting way to live. It just is. And it leads to a lot of really bad decisions where pig slop starts to look like good food. And that leads me to application number three. Home is only found in Jesus. Because home is a destin home is not a destination, it's a relationship. If you can get this, this is gonna change your life. Home is not a destination, it's a relationship. This past Thanksgiving, my sister brought a card game uh, to the table. We were all having dinner together, and it's just some cards that everybody takes a couple, and it's just got like general life questions about what kind of things you're grateful for or how life is going and they're just kind of conversation cards you know and the card that I got asked this question it said where do you see your life in 10 years now can I be, can I be real with you I freaking hate questions like this I, I hate them I, I, I just I hate them with a passion I do it's like the ultimate cliche interview question right you know you know, we here at Taco Bell only want applicants that have a clear vision of their life, right? Where do you see yourself in 10 years? Not here, bro, I can tell you that. <laughs> but having been through some of the things that I've been through in my life, things that I never thought I'd have to go through, I, I, I didn't see them coming. This is what I told my family that I've learned, that, that here's the thing. Ten years ago, in the past, I, I would have never predicted in a squillion years, throwing a lot of big numbers out there today, not in a squillion years would I have predicted both the best things in my life over the last decade or the worst things in my life in the last decade. I would have never been able to predict either one of them, either the good or the bad. And because of that, because of that, what I've learned is that what's most important isn't the what's of life, it's the who's. Who you're doing life with will have a greater impact on you than any what you're ever gonna walk through. I can't tell you what's gonna happen to you in the next 10 years. What's going to happen to me? Do I have hopes? Of course I do. Do I have dreams? Absolutely. Will I pursue them? With all my heart. Absolutely I'll pursue my dreams. Do I have desired outcomes that I will like try to reverse engineer and get them into existence in my life? Of course I do. Have you met me? I'm as type A as it gets. Of course I will. But does any of that, does any of that mean anything about the reality of how those things are going to look when or if they come into existence and finally arrive in my life? 1,000% no. You can chase it. You should pursue it. You should go after it. But when it arrives, if it doesn't look how you thought it would look, what's going to matter more is your who than your what. So, if life has changed me and I can't go back to how it used to be, 
And if my circumstances and my feelings are always in flux and everything's always in changing, and if life is unpredictable and it's messy sometimes and it's just completely jacked up on the one hand and on the other hand, like I have other days where life is really beautiful and it's really going well uh, and I'm kind of fluctuating between these things to the point that I just, I never imagined I'd have gotten here in my life. If that's the case and I want to go home again, like, like what do I do? How can I find home in the next 10 years if the last 10 years have kicked my butt? This is where the Gospel of John has a suggestion. And it's all about how home isn't a what, it's a who. He says that the word became flesh and blood and it moved into the neighborhood. We all live off his generous abundance, gift after gift. We got the basics from Moses and this exuberant giving and receiving endless knowing and understanding all this came through jesus the messiah no one has ever seen god not so much as a glimpse but this one-of-a-kind god expression who exists at the very heart of the father has made him plain as day you know here's the reality most people think of christianity they think of what we're doing um, even here at church as kind of an eternal life transaction you know what I mean by that? Most people think of Christianity a, as a solution to the life after death problem. That, that's how most people think of it. So when I go to church or when I practice my faith, I'm solving the matter of my eternal destination. Jesus says, finding your home in him is not about what address the house is at. It's about a relationship with the one who owns it. That's the difference. So what Christmas means is that God is not interested in your religious platitudes for a faith that's based on some pie in the sky, hope for when I die kind of a thing. He's not interested in a religious show of faith that can be reduced to some kind of a formula. What God aimed at with the idea of Christmas, it isn't pretty, it isn't neat, it isn't clean, it isn't tidy. What he aimed at was people sitting in pig slop. He said, oh, they're, they're in a barn and they're eating pig slop? Fine, that's where I'm sending my son to be born in a barn. That's what I'm doing. He aimed at Christmas, at, he aimed it at shepherds and peasants and tax collectors and prostitutes. He aimed it at the sick and the starving and those who feel unworthy. God is not concerned that you can't get into his gated community when you die. He's concerned and interested in the fact that his children are hurting, they're broken, they're suffering, they're grieving. It's happening here, it's happening now, and we've tried what we've tried before to get them home, it hasn't worked. John said that's what Moses was doing. That's what it was all about. I'm trying to download the maps address into your phone, into your maps app to try to get you home with Moses and the law. But you're so far out of signal range that I can't even do that because the farm you're sitting on is so far away. So this is what God said. He said, I'm going to go sit with them in the slop. And while they're there, I'm not going to be reminding them of my address and how they need to live better and do better to get there. I'm going to remind them of their relationship, their position, and their standing with me. And they're going to be able to get home, not because we corrected an address that they're typing wrong into their maps with their life. We're going to get them home because when I moved into the neighborhood and I sent my son to die for them and I paid the price for the home that I'm now living in with the death of my son. I didn't just buy the house next door. I bought the whole city, I bought the whole country, and I bought the whole farm. I didn't just come to move into the neighborhood and hang out for a while because I heard they have good barbecues. I paid the price to buy the whole city they're living in why? So that everywhere they go and everywhere they've wandered, whatever they're doing, their home is now with me. I can be present with them in the middle of the pig slop from wherever they are. So God meets you in the pain and he meets you in the addiction and he sits with you in the parked car wondering about the purpose of your life and he speaks to you about your feelings of uncertainty and inadequacy and he frees those of us who've been a prisoner of our choices and the circumstances we're living in 
for far too long. Jesus said, watch this now, he said at the Last Supper, and in fact, on your way in, you should have gotten one of these little communion cups. If you have one of these, go ahead and take it out right now. If you don't, maybe raise your hand. We've got some people passing them out in back there. But this is what he said. This is what he said. Jesus said at the Last Supper, he said, I will not eat of the bread or drink of the cup until everybody's home in my father's house and when we get there when we get there he's going to kill the fatted calf and he's going to pour out the blood of the lamb it's going to be steak and wine for everybody it is but until that day comes here's what I want you to know as we get ready to take this together Wherever you're at in your life, whatever ground you're standing on right now, even if it feels uncertain, if it feels shaky, feels like it might be quaking underneath you a little bit, just as you are, the place that you're standing right now is holy ground. This is holy ground. This is where your journey home begins. In the place that you are, in the space that you are, just as you are, This is the beginning of you living under new ownership in the neighborhood. So it's time you started living like it. Is that good news for anybody here today? It is for me. It is for me. Your home isn't a place. It's a person. It's a person. It's a person. It's a person. Who, your who is greater than any what that will ever happen to you. So stop being ashamed of yourself. God has purchased the land you're standing on. So everybody can come home. Your calling isn't gone. Your purpose isn't gone. Your position is secure. Your shame is unnecessary. Your plan, that plan that he has for you is still in place. You're not far away from him. And God says in his word that he is near to the brokenhearted. Near to the brokenhearted, which means he's nearer to you than you know. Steak and wine might not be on the table yet, but we can smell it on the grill. Yeah? Because I'm in his neighborhood now. Wherever I'm at, I'm in his neighborhood. It's time to get something better to fill us up. I want you to take the communion thing here that we've got for you, and I want you to peel off the top, take the wafer. The body says that or the, the Bible says that this is representative of the body, which was broken for us. And that when we eat, when we drink, we remember the death and the price that God paid to move into the neighborhood. So I want you to just take a moment and bring all of this before God. Bring the ground you're on right before God this morning. He knows where you're at. I want to invite you to bow your heads in prayer. And let's just take a moment together. And then we will share the cup and the bread together. Take a moment before God on this. Jesus, where we stand right now is holy ground. You've called us home. You've paid the price, not just to move into the neighborhood, but that you might have ownership over all of the things that separated us from you. Help us to remember that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate us from your love. There is nothing on this earth, nothing in our minds, no pig slop that we've eaten, no stink that we're sitting in, no farm that's too far away that you can't find us, get a hold of us, repurpose us, and send us back out. Remind us of your calling. Remind us of our purpose and your plan for us. Help us to start embracing that exactly where we are, as broken as that may be. Would you eat of the bread with me? Would you drink the cup with me? Jesus, call us home. 
and remind us that it's never as far away as we think. We're going to end today by singing a worship song that's all about coming home. It's actually called Homecoming. And can I just encourage you wherever you're at? I know this song might be new to you, but even if you don't know this song, take these words in and just blast them out from your heart. Because wherever you're at, you're not as far away from home as you think. And it can be real for you today. So I want to invite, to, invite you to stand and join us as we close in worship together.